let's see. Good morning. Uh, I need to make sure that uh, the stream is actually working. I believe it is, but if you can see me or hear me, uh, please say hi and chat really quick. Also, might as well say say where you're from. Uh, I, last week we had a lot of people from all over the world, and it was it was inspiring to see everybody kind of coming together and and learning together. So it was it was definitely a, a fun and exciting uh, stream for me, especially after the Drupal live stream, which is a little more humdrum and uh, not as exciting and interesting because I'm fighting with Drupal's migration system, uh, that's a lot fewer uh, people are on that, so it's not, not as fun to see where everybody's from. It is fun, but uh, anyway, it's exciting to see everybody. Uh, Cape Town, oh, very nice. Uh, Colorado, up in the air, about a, a mile high. Albany, so looks like people from all over the place. Uh, as, as I promised last week, I'm wearing my uh, Netherlands shirt today. This is one of my Netherlands shirts. The uh, Geerling family hails from the southern part of the Netherlands, and uh, been over there one time in my life. I I almost had a chance to go there again this year, but of course, uh, coronavirus, COVID nineteen came into existence, and that squashed all hope. So maybe I'll get there in a year or two. Uh, we'll see. Um, but I'm glad to be here with you today, and. Uh, so far, knock on wood, uh, haven't had too many ill effects due to coronavirus, though. It's uh, kind of sad. I'm, I'm hearing a couple more stories of people being furloughed or uh, experiencing layoffs, and that's part of the reason why I'm doing this, this particular live stream series and why I have the books free. And originally, I announced that I was going to make my books free until the end of March. Uh, last week, the uh, CTO of Device42 actually contacted me and said, Hey, Jeff, I like what you're doing. I want to make it another month. How can we do that? And I said, I'm, I'm open to any suggestions, and, and uh, they basically are sponsoring me for uh, this month to keep giving away my books for free, which is awesome. So if you know anybody that would benefit from Ansible for DevOps, which is this book, uh, or Ansible for Kubernetes, please send them to uh, my, uh, my website, jeffgearling.com. It has a link to those books. Um, and uh, tell them about this video streaming series and, and let them watch it. Uh, as a reminder, all these episodes will be recorded and available afterwards as well. Um, but um, I also told Device42 that I would, I would give them a plug because that's, it's extremely generous what they're doing, and I'm, I'm very grateful. I've written so many times about the importance of supporting open source development uh, because the tools we use, Ansible and Kubernetes and Drupal I use a lot. All these different tools that I use, so many of them are open source based on community development work. And most of the people that build these tools, uh, you know, some people are sponsored by a company or they work at a company full time and get to work on these things, but that's a very small percentage of the people that contribute to open source. And just like me, most people that do open source development have families, we have full-time jobs, uh, we have a lot of things to do, and the open source work usually doesn't contribute back much to our bottom line. Uh, so I told Device42 that I would give them a plug, and uh, this is it. Ansible is great for driving auto IT automation, but to make the automation work, you need to make sure that you have an accurate real-time picture of all your IT infrastructure, and that's where Device42 comes in. Uh, they provide comprehensive discovery of the entire IT estate from mainframes to Kubernetes and just like Ansible, and this is the reason I like them more than a lot of other uh, systems like theirs, is that it's agentless. Uh, you can try it for free, download a trial at device42.com and see how it can take your Ansible automation to the next level. Uh, so thank you again to Device42 and if, you, if, you are, uh, if you're benefiting from this and getting uh, the free books and things, please reach out and give them a shout out on Twitter. They're at device42. Um, so thank you to them. And last week in, uh, this ep in, in episode one, we started off in the beginning of the Ansible for DevOps, DevOps book in the preface and introduction, introducing why Ansible exists, what it's for. Uh, and we started in chapter one and two doing very basic things, describing to Ansible an inventory of a server that we had running in, in Amazon EC2. Uh, and then we had uh, we had a very, very basic playbook that installed NTP and got it running. Um, it looks like there's a lot of, <laughs> let's hope you don't support the Netherlands football team. I actually do. Uh, and the few times that it's ever happened that the Netherlands played the USA, I was always cheering for the Netherlands. Don't tell the US men's team that I did that. Um, 
but uh, yeah, I, I'm very happy. Uh, and someone's saying my Patreon link is a 504. I'll try to fix that later. And, and again, uh, this is both being recorded and a live stream. So if you have a question in here, I try to go back through and look at the chat and answer anything that I didn't answer in the video. Sometimes the stream, uh, sometimes the chat kind of gets away from me and I can't check it during the stream. Uh, so don't worry, I usually see anything that you're talking about. Um, but I'm going to, uh, in this episode, get more into ad hoc commands. And uh, between last video and today, I actually looked it up. Um, so this is the word, ad hoc, ad hoc. And it sounds like in American English, it's pronounced ad hoc. And in British English, it's pronounced ad hoc. So I, I'm an American, so I'll say ad hoc. But uh, if I say ad hoc, um, you know, don't kill me. Um, so anyway, these commands are a way for Ansible to quickly do a specific task or run a specific module on any servers in your Ansible inventory. And uh, I put in here the title conducting an orchestra because that's kind of a lot of things in Ansible. You're kind of um, you're kind of being the conductor of the orchestra of all your servers. And uh, the cool thing is you can operate on one server, you can operate on 10 servers, you can operate on hundreds of servers. And we're gonna explore how Ansible treats all those different scenarios in this lesson. Um, and Oliver's also mentioning with Patreon and all that, it might be loading okay or not, you might be having other connection issues. Uh, but yes, you can sponsor me on GitHub, which is uh, very helpful. I have something like 20 people who are sponsoring me. There's you know sponsorship ranges for any kind of amount. Um, somebody says, New York English is ad hack. Yeah, that's, uh, and, and Boston would be like ad hoc, something like that. Um, I actually have relatives in all these different places, so uh, it would be interesting to have them all read this and, and see what they say. Uh, but there's a lot of different things you can do with these kind of commands. Uh, uh, usually it's, it's more useful to use a playbook, which we'll get into in the next chapter. Uh, but I often use ad hoc commands to uh, check on resources or to get log files or things like that, just when I need to debug a situation. There's a lot of times, uh, you, you know, when you have a running server that it's doing something that you don't expect, or if you need the emergency, do a command on them, restart a service on all your servers or something like that. Um, it, these can be helpful for that. Um, but it's, I've seen people do things like applying patches and updates with yum or apt, um, checking resource usage, checking log files, like I said, uh, managing users and groups. Uh, you could you could have an, a situation where you need to quickly add or remove access for a particular user on your systems. You can use these for those. Uh, managing host files and DNS settings. Quickly copying a file to or from a server. Uh, deploying an application. This is something where it starts getting in the realm of you probably should be using playbooks for this stuff. Uh, rebooting servers. That's something I do a lot. Uh, if I if there's an if there's a security update and it's really hot, like I remember for Heartbleed. Uh, that was the first one where it was like, I need to get all my servers upgraded immediately. Uh, I just went in and, and ran the command to run up upgrades and reboot immediately. And uh, that was extremely helpful for me because I didn't have to write a playbook and test the playbook and then do all that. Uh, and managing cron jobs, something as mundane as that. Um, so uh, most of these tasks, like I said, it's it's better to run them in a playbook if you can, but, but sometimes... Uh, Sometimes it's, it's more important just to run the command and get the data or results right away. And also, if you have a monitoring, monitoring system in place, uh, usually it's better to just use that monitoring system to see things like resource usage or log patterns and things like that. Uh, but there, there are times when the monitoring system has problems and you still got to go into the servers individually. And uh, using Ansible for it is a lot easier. Um, so the first thing that, that uh, is useful for this uh, to demonstrate how it works is, um, again, I'm going to rely on Vagrant and VirtualBox. Uh, you can use Vagrant with other systems too, but uh, it's nice to be able to use Vagrant to build a server to test on. Vagrant can also manage multiple servers locally uh, or in the cloud or anything uh, through the Vagrant file. So I'm going to show you how to do that today. We're going to set up, um, and I don't actually have the graphics on my computer with me here, uh, but I'll show you in the picture here if I can get it uh, get it aligned. Whoops, I need to move my mouse so I can see. So we're going to set up a system like this where there's one database server and two application servers. Uh, and we're going to do that using a Vagrant file. So I'm going to go in here and open up. Let me I need to change my windows here. 
on my other screen so I can actually see see what I'm doing and make sure I'm not messing things up or putting somewhere something somewhere you can't see it. So I'm going to go into my uh, downloads folder and I'm going to make a directory for this project called uh, ad hoc and go into it. And then I'm going to create a vagrant file. So again, the, the, to do that, you can just say vagrant init. And then the box that I'm going to use is yearling guy sent to us seven. And someone I think asked, uh, where can I find boxes to use? And uh, that is, you can go to Vagrant, I think it's Vagrant Cloud. Uh, I maintain a number of boxes, uh, but Vagrant Cloud has a listing of all the boxes that are available. I have boxes for Ubuntu 20, CentOS 8, CentOS 7, Debian 10. I usually, I tend to work with uh, CentOS, uh, Debian, Ubuntu, and sometimes Fedora for my project. So uh, in Vagrant, I maintain those boxes. I also maintain images in Docker that have Ansible installed on them. And so you can use those as well. Uh, but let me go back here. Uh, in Vagrant Cloud, you can search through it and find boxes for almost any platform in the world. Uh, Mark says, long live Vagrant. Yeah. It's it's kind of, you know, it's been around for a decade or so, just like uh, it's it's a little older than Ansible, in fact. And um, it's still extremely useful. I, a lot of people have moved on to other systems and tools, but in the end, we're managing servers, and that's what Vagrant does too. So I like to use it along with Ansible for a lot of my testing and exploration work. Uh, so I've, I've created this, uh, this Vagrant file, so I'm going to open... I'm going to open this folder up. Uh, subl is a shortcut for Sublime, and in, on the Mac you can give it a directory and it will pass that directory into that command. And Sublime lets me open up this project in Sublime. So here's the Vagrant file that was just created. Um, I'm going to delete a lot of this extra junk that I don't need. All these comments. Uh, and uh, we're going to set up the configuration for this so that it will work a little bit more easily for our testing purposes. One thing I'm going to do is I'm going to say config.ssh.insertkey equals false. Um, usually what Vagrant will do is it will insert a, a created SSH key into the virtual machines for a little bit of security. For my testing purposes, a lot of times I, I ignore that and just use the insecure key that comes with Vagrant just because they're going to be local machines that nobody's going to access outside of my, my own computer anyway. Um, and then I'm also going to turn off the synced folder. Uh, Vagrant by default uh, synced folder uh, dot. Vagrant by default has a, a, it sets up a synced folder that's the current working directory into uh, the folder Vagrant inside the VM. And sometimes that can cause issues. And you know, if you don't need it, I wouldn't enable it. So I often do this in my, my test playbooks as well. Uh, and then I'm going to set up <clears throat> some virtual box options. Since I'm going to have multiple machines, I don't want them to have a ton of memory because then my computer, which is already straining from doing this live stream, as you can see from the CPU gauge up here, uh, it's going to run out of memory and, and be even worse. So I'm going to set uh, config.vm.provider virtual box. <clears throat> so this is setting uh, setting up things for virtual box. Uh, do v v.memory equals 256 megabytes and v.linked clone equals true. <clears throat> this is uh, this linked clone thing is kind of a micro optimization. It, it lets you build machines a little more quickly. Instead of creating a separate virtual machine from scratch, it can create one and then it can kind of link a clone of that so it's a little faster to start them up. Um, if you don't do that, it's not the end of the world. It's just, it's a little bit slower. Uh, so now we've, we've told uh, Vagrant about all the things that we want our machines to do. Now we need to define three different servers. So I'm gonna say uh, app server one, and I'm gonna define that with config.vm.define, not divine, define. Uh, app one, I'll call it, do app one. Oops, I can't type today. There we go, app1. And I'm going to give it a host name and give it an IP address. So I'm going to say app, uh, actually, I'm going to just call it app instead of app1. app.vm.hostname equals 
work for orchestration app app one dot test and then i'm going to give it a network an ip address so i'm going to say app dot vm dot network private network i can't type again uh, ip is 192.168.60.4 and that's going to be a private network that only runs on my local machine but lets me communicate with the the vms through the uh through the networking that Vagrant sets up with VirtualBox. So I have App Server 1, and I'm going to copy this out and make two more servers. One is App Server 2, and one will be the database. So I'll say App Server 2. This will be App 2, or App 2. And you might also wonder why I use the test domain. <clears throat> I used to use .local back a long time ago, uh, but there were some issues with that. Uh, sometimes macOS versions would use the .local uh, root domain to, to do some special things and that could screw things up. Some applications and VPNs and things would use that. So I stopped using that and I started using .dev. Well, a few years ago, Google actually bought the rights to .dev and so .dev started having issues in certain scenarios. So now I use .test because .test was uh, officially set up to be like a local testing environment root domain. So most of my examples nowadays use .test in them. Uh, because that's it's just easier to, to work with that. Um, and you're not going to run into weird DNS issues like you could in uh, other cases. So I have app1, app2, and this is going to have the IP address.5. Vagrant can actually automatically set IP addresses, but I'm doing this because I want Ansible to interact with them a little more easily. So I'm going to say db. So this will be database server, db server. And this will be db and dot six. All right, so I have these. I have this Vagrant file set up. It's going to uh, set up VMs using the CentOS seven box. I turned off the synced folder that comes with Vagrant by default. Set the VMs to use two hundred fifty six megs of RAM just to save my computer from dying because it's about ready to die. Um, and I'm setting up three three different VMs: app one, app two, and db. And I'm going to run uh, Vagrant up. And that's going to start these three VMs. <clears throat> so it takes a few minutes, especially if you've never downloaded the, the CentOS 7 box yet. Uh, it has to download that. And it looks like I have an error uh, app. What do I have here? 930. Oh, DB. Uh, because I called it DB right here. So do that. Let's run Vagrant up again. And um, it's going to, just like last week, it's going to download the box if you don't have it. Uh, and then it will start up three VMs in this case. Last week, we just started up one. But this week, we're going to set up three. Later on in the book, there's a few examples that set up like five or six different things. And uh, yeah, and some Aaron just mentioned. Uh, the, the hard thing with these streams is that because my computer's a bit slower, I, well, it, there's a couple reasons for it. OBS wants to, the software I use to stream these things once as much uh, CPU and GPU as possible. I have a MacBook Pro 13 inch and it's a 2016 uh, and it doesn't have the fastest of everything. I, I even bought the non touch bar version because I hate the touch bar. And, um, and so uh, OBS kind of takes up all that, that CPU and stuff and it adds on maybe five to 10 seconds of delay in the stream. And then YouTube, it's little thing that, that runs in the background it's also using up some of the some of the CPU, and it seems to cause another 15 to 20 seconds of delay. So everything I say, it's 30 to 45 seconds before someone on the stream sees it, and then someone might react to it and leave a chat message. And then I'm sitting here, and uh, you know, and in this case, Aaron found the issue after I fixed it, but I hadn't really fixed it yet in real time. So good job, Aaron. Uh, you get a thumbs up or something. Actually, Oliver just gave you thumbs up, so good job. Um, while it's uh, bringing up these machines, uh, I'll talk a little bit more about um, how we're going to connect to them. With, with the example from earlier, we had, I think it was just uh, one server, and we called it, what was it? Uh, that was installing Ansible. We did a lot in the last video in a short amount of time. Uh, but in the last one, we just set up one server and we let we let Vagrant uh, connect to it using Vagrant's generated inventory, which you can do. Uh, you can run, we could have an Ansible playbook that runs in here and Vagrant will intelligently create a temporary inventory file and pass that into Ansible through the background. 
Uh, but we're not going to do that in this case. We're going to create our own inventory uh, describing all these servers. So I'm going to create a new file and call it inventory. Man, even saving a file is slow right now. Uh, inventory. And note, I've never tried doing this during a live stream, so I don't even know if the live stream is going to continue working throughout uh, all this. Um, but I'm going to create an inventory file, and any line in the inventory file that begins with a, a hash or pound is a comment line. So I'm going to comment that these are going to be the application servers, and we'll call them app. That'll be the group. Again, the inventory groups are in the square brackets. And uh, last, last week, I know some people were discussing inventory file formats. Uh, typically, I start out with this format, which is the INI style inventory format. It's the oldest format that Ansible's had. And the basic style is you have a group in brackets, and then you have servers listed. So like 192.168.60.4, and the other one is .5. Um, and then you have database server, and that's db. So the group is going to be db, and it's .6. Uh, so this is like the, the INI style. You can also do YAML, and there's other ways as well that you can set up inventory for Ansible. Uh, a couple of those ways we'll get into in later chapters. I don't want to, we don't want to get too bogged down with inventory right now. The m main thing that I'm trying to show is how you can just tell Ansible, hey, I have these different servers and they're in different groups so I can work with them different ways. Uh, so the next thing that we're going to do though is uh, setting up two groups like this lets us operate on app servers or DB servers. But what if we also want to be able to operate on all the servers? Like let's say Heartbleed happens and we need to upgrade all the servers to the latest version as soon as possible. <laughs> and thanks, Oliver. Let's crowdsource me a new uh, MacBook Pro. That would be uh, pretty awesome. Um, I've, I've been considering, th so the new MacBook Air just came out and it's faster than this current MacBook Pro, uh, the CPU at least. Uh, but I have been thinking about getting a, the, the 15 inch at some point just because the uh, it has a dedicated GPU that might work a little bit better with OBS, and it's just faster for everything, video editing and all that kind of stuff. But anyway, this I can't complain too much. This computer's been great. Uh, the worst part was when the battery started expanding because this was the recalled MacBook Pro. Uh, one morning I came to my computer and I grabbed it, and the uh, entire keyboard was kind of bowed about like this, and the space bar was like this, and the screen was also starting to bend a little bit. And uh, I found out after the fact, I had brought it into Apple and they replaced it. It was like five days out of service. After the fact, there was a recall a few weeks later on the MacBook Pro for expanding batteries. And that's always fun. They said it can expand so much that it explodes. Luckily, mine did not do that. Um, but we want to be able to uh, operate on all these servers. And there's, there's not a way in the Ansible ad hoc uh, command to say like operate on these two groups that's, that's easy and not clumsy. So I can actually make another group. I'm going to call it multi. And uh, in this syntax, I can use a colon and say children. And that's a special thing that tells Ansible that this group is going to be a group of groups instead of just, um, just a group of servers. So I'm going to say uh, this group has all the servers. And I'm going to say app and db. So uh, when you use children like this, you can give it uh, different groups, and it will put those groups together. Uh, and then also, uh, to connect to the servers, if, you if you're using just the username that's your, your normal um, logged in user, so mine is like Jay Gearling, I think. Yeah, it's Jay Gearling. Uh, and you have your SSH key in your SSH uh, keychain, or if you have, have it in your default location, that's great. Uh, but for this case, I'm going to uh, I'm going to define the SSH user that Ansible is going to use, as well as the SSH key that it's going to use because it's Ansible can't auto discover them and the key is not in my in my uh, SSH keychain right now. Uh, so I'm going to do that by giving the variables to this multi group, and to do that, I'm going to say uh, variables for all the servers, and I'm going to put them into multi vars. And uh, the first one is Ansible SSH user, and I'm going to set that to Vagrant. Uh, so this variable tells Ansible what user to use. And similarly, there's Ansible SSH private key file. And uh, Vagrant, by default, creates, as I said earlier, I, I use this option to turn off the insert key 
uh, thing. If, if you have this on, then, then Vagrant's going to create a, a random key in a, in a place on your system, and you'd have to find where that is using Ansible's SSH, or Vagrant's SSH config command. Uh, but I'm just going to use the default key that comes with Vagrant, and that's in uh, home folder .vagrant .d slash insecure private key. Uh, so this is my inventory file, and I can use this uh, with Ansible. I can use it with ad hoc commands, and I can use it with playbooks if I want to. Uh, for now, I'm just going to use it for ad hoc commands because that's what's in Chapter 3. And uh, we're going to start working on these three VMs. And if I open up VirtualBox, uh, you'll see that Vagrant created these three different running machines and configured the networking and all that kind of stuff for me. Uh, so here's the three ad hoc app1, app2, and db. So I'll get back out of VirtualBox, and um, I'll move on to running some of these commands. So, you know, a as I mentioned earlier, in the book I have a lot of tips. Uh, tips are things with a little key, uh, and info is things with a little I up here, and warnings are things that are important to remember to uh, protect yourself for security purposes, that kind of thing. And I have a tip here that, that says a lot of the things that we're about to do uh, you know, you might be like, well, I monitor my servers with Nagios or with Prometheus or whatever tool that you use, um, Munin, Cacti, Hyperic, all these different systems. Um, you should be monitoring things that way. This is more to illustrate what Ansible ad hoc commands can do. Um, and, uh, and also, another thing that I, I think is interesting is a lot of organizations, a lot of groups don't monitor their servers externally too. So sometimes you might you might have issues uh, with your monitoring system internally, especially if it's on a private network or inside your VPC in a Amazon. Uh, but there's actually problems in the outside world accessing your servers. So I always make sure that if I'm running an application that's accessible over the internet, I have something outside of my own tools monitoring it. So I use Pingdom a lot. I run a service called Server Check-In. It's called servercheckin um, there, There's other things too that are, that are either free or low cost that can just monitor a server, make sure it's up or make sure that a web page loads and has certain content. Um, so I always like to, to mention that to people because some people don't think about that and they have these great monitoring tools in place, but it doesn't help if your site's down to the outside world. Um, so the first thing we're gonna do here uh, uh, it looks like, oh, Devin is saying that Ansible 2.0 has deprecated the Ansible, the SSH part. So, yeah, yeah, I, I, I forgot to, uh, to update the book here. And I, I'm, I'm basically going through the book at version 1.22. By the time that you're watching this video, if you're not watching this live, uh, this book might be at version 1.40 or 1.8 or whatever it'll be. Uh, so some of these things will change over time, and, and one of those things that has changed is these variables can be Ansible user instead of Ansible SSH user. Uh, so uh, I'm going to leave this for now just because it's following the book at version 1.2.2. Uh, but if you do find any issues, um, like Devin has found here, please feel free to go to uh, the, the books repository and mention them. Uh, and if it's during the video, you can just mention which episode it's in. Uh, if, you, if you see what page it's on in the book, please feel free to pop the page in there. I usually try to get uh, all these little bug fixes in by the next book version, and I do that every couple months. Uh, so again, a reminder, the books are free right now. Go, go grab them free while you can from LeanPub. And every time I update the book, you'll get those updates free forever. Uh, so let's go ahead and start using this inventory that we just created. Uh, the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to say Ansible Multi. So again, explaining these parts of this, this is Ansible is used for running these ad hoc commands. Uh, multi is the group name or the server name, and um, I'm going to have to I'm going to pass in the in inventory file. So I'm going to say dash i inventory, and the argument positions don't matter here. I could say Ansible dash i inventory and then multi, um, and then I'm going to say dash a uh, for the argument again. Uh, going on last week's episode, uh, if you if you don't provide a module, that's dash m for a module, Ansible defaults to the command module. And so um, you can just pass arguments straight to the command module, which is a command to run. So I'm going to run host name, and we'll see what it gives us. I'm also going to grab a quick drink of water here. Okay, so it gave us uh, the host names for these, app1, app2, and db. Um, 
And it, this is also a point where some people might start getting errors. Uh, you might see error messages about uh, not accepting um, the host key, or uh, you might see like no host match, that kind of thing. Uh, usually that indicates either you have a problem in the, in the inventory file, or if you've never logged into these servers before, uh, you do need to make sure that you accept the host key or you set an option to ignore the host key or uh, like you, you can do what I do in my uh, SSH config file, which is in your home folder .ssh folder and it's config. Uh, you can tell it to ignore a host key for a particular server or you can, you can accept the host key when you set up the server, all these different things. Uh, these are just general SSH issues that sometimes can surface when you're managing lots of servers with Ansible. Um, uh, so another thing that you might notice, so that this first run we did, uh, we got kind of lucky. It goes 1 and then 2 and then DB, just like we defined them in the inventory right here. Uh, but if I keep running this, I'm going to run it again and see what happens. Of course, it's a lot slower with the CPU being maxed out. Um, if I run it again, you'll notice that the second time, the database actually returned first, and then 1 and 2. If I keep running it again and again, every time the order is going to be a little different. And the reason for that is that Ansible, uh, by default, runs in a parallel parallel uh, nature. It, it, by default, uses five forks. So it, it forks itself five times to be able to run the command as quickly as possible on a group of servers. And you can actually change that behavior to see how Ansible can manage the servers in a different way uh, using the dash F flag for forks. And so if I say dash F1, instead of sending out the command to five servers at a time and getting back the results five servers at a time, it's going to send it to one server, wait for that server to respond, and then it's going to send it to the next one, wait for that to respond, and so on. So in this case, uh, you can see it, it went in the right order it, according to our inventory file. It went to the app one, app two, and test uh, because we're just using one fork. This is useful because uh, with a lot of people, you might have you might have 100 servers or 1,000 servers that you're managing, and if you want to do, a, do something on them really fast, let's say it's emergency time and you have Heartbleed or something else that you can't quickly get a playbook up and, and run it for it. Um, although, you know, the end goal of all this is that you would be able to get a playbook up quickly, get it into your CI system, run it against your host because playbooks are a little more auditable. Um, but if you did need to do this really quick, you could set forks uh, to 100, and assuming that your control system has enough memory and CPU available to fork the, the Python processes that Ansible uses uh, that many times to be able to run that command on that many servers at the same time, uh, you can run commands on a lot of servers in a very little amount of time. And again, this is all just using SSH. You don't have to have anything installed on those servers to be able to do all this stuff. Uh, so that's, that's how Ansible... Uh, runs tasks in parallel by default. And, um, and again, just to, just to also prove that um, you, can, you can put these arguments anywhere else in the ordering here, you can pass the inventory first and say multi. And that's going to um, do the exact same thing as up here. Uh, and you can even put the, the group on the end of the thing. It doesn't really matter what position these arguments are in. And sometimes I, I try to always do the inventory first, then the group, and then the module and arguments, but sometimes I kind of mess that up. Please don't, uh, don't hate me for it. Uh, you know, I'll try my best to do it consistently, but don't be confused if I, if I go in different orders. Uh, some, uh, some other things that I've done in the past uh, just to see uh, some information really quick is sometimes I use like df.h or dash h to see uh, how much space is available. Uh, I, I'm reminded of last time I was managing an Elasticsearch cluster. Elasticsearch, for anybody who hasn't ever run it before, can very quickly eat up your disk space, especially if you have a Kubernetes cluster with hundreds or thousands of pods running, all of them dumping all of their logs into your Elasticsearch cluster. And uh, we hadn't set up the, the, the uh, Elasticsearch curator job correctly, so the disks kept running out, so it was important to be able to see which servers the disk space was um, was being used up. Like, and, it, and the other thing is that Elasticsearch kind of uses up so much memory or so much uh, disk space, but then it, it, it kills the process and, and makes the um, index stale if it gets up to like 80% by default. So we were, we were having that issue, and I was quickly able to see which servers uh, we had to 
quickly remediate in, in our uh, search cluster because of that. Uh, so df.h is um, a helpful command. Uh, free free-h gives you the available memory. Uh, these are a lot of different commands you can run to kind of get a quick idea of, of how your systems are doing outside of your other monitoring tools. Uh, another thing that I've had to uh, check up on a lot is uh, the date on systems. So I, uh, I mentioned earlier the service server check-in that I use for server monitoring. And that's one system where the actual timestamps of everything, so it, it, it's a distributed system where there's some servers that do the checks around the globe, uh, running in different hosting providers so that uh, I have some redundancy in case like Amazon goes down or Google Cloud goes down, that kind of thing. Um, and I, early on in the process, I was having a lot of weird issues that I couldn't really figure out what was going on. And this also happens with databases and search systems and all this kind of stuff. It's important to always have the same date on all of your different servers and make sure that the time zone is the same. Uh, some of the hosting providers I was using for server check-in would change the, the time zone on my servers for some reason. Even though I had set it manually and forced it to UTC, they would change it to the local time of that server, and that was throwing off my scripts. Um, now, the scripts should be probably a little more foolproof, of course, and always use UTC by default anyways. But this, this threw them off, and that, that alerted me to the problem. I need to fix the time zone handling of my, uh, of my application. So, you know, date is another command you might want to do, uh, might want to use uh, when you're managing your servers. Another thing that's important to note is that anytime I run any command, Ansible is always reporting changed. And that's because Ansible can't know when you run just a random command like date or uh, free-h. It's not actually changing your system, but Ansible can't know that because you're not using one of Ansible's modules to do this stuff. Uh, when you run arbitrary commands, Ansible is always going to say, you know, something changed, even if something might not have changed. We'll find ways uh, that we can use Ansible's modules and see if it changed or didn't change in just a minute. Um, uh, there's, there's another command that you can use. Uh, it's the setup module that can give you back all of the information that Ansible can see about the server. Every once in a while I do this uh, just so that I can see, um, uh, see some of the data that Ansible can see about the server. And that you can do, I'm just going to do it on one server, so db-m uh, setup. And that's going to return uh, pretty much everything Ansible discovers automatically about the server. Of course, it's taken forever. And so you can see it, it gives you like the IP address, uh, the Python version on the server. It gives you information about the, the processors. This is useful sometimes when you're actually building a playbook and you need to know something about the server that you're going to use to key on in the playbook or to template a file. So it's helpful to know that the setup module, if you do dash M setup, gives you back all the information Ansible can figure out about the server. Um, let's see. Uh, Darko mentions, can I post my Ansible recipes for managing Elasticsearch? And that answer is a definite yes. Uh, there's, I already have a few roles on Ansible Galaxy, galaxy.ansible.com for Elasticsearch. And uh, later in the book, we're actually going to do an example building an Elasticsearch, uh, uh, Elasticsearch uh, log stash and Kibana using FileBeat to send uh, search or to send the log data back to Elasticsearch. So we'll get to that a little bit later in the book. And that's a, an example I'm pretty excited about because it's one of the one of those things where there's a lot of complex systems at play and Ansible is, does a great job of, of orchestrating, putting them all together using playbooks. Um, so we'll get to that soon, don't worry. Uh, so another thing that I'm going to um, show now in, instead of just the commands, which it's, you'll also note that when I ran this, this command here, the uh, setup module, it's all in green text because it says success. Uh, it knows that it didn't change anything because when you use the setup module, it's just gathering information. It's not necessarily going to change something. Uh, so let me go back down. And Aaron asks, is, uh, is the setup module the same thing as gather facts? Yes. Uh, and in fact, there are some examples that I'll get to later where in a playbook, you might turn off fact gathering but later on in the playbook, you might need those facts, so you can actually use the setup module to get those facts in a playbook, even if you turn off gather facts. We'll get to that later. Um, so the next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to uh, run a command to install a package on these systems using Ansible's yum module. Uh, and so to do that, I'm going to say multi, do this on all the servers. Uh, and I'm going to use dash b 
dash b again is become. That means become a different user, and by default that user's root using sudo. So <clears throat> when I install packages, I need to be sudo. I need to run them with sudo, because otherwise my user, who's a lower level user, is not going to have the privileges to be able to install packages. So I'm going to say dash b to become the sudo root user, uh, and I'm going to use the yum module. Uh, last week, somebody asked um, why use the yum module, and there's also the package module. There's actually a bunch of different packaging modules. There's yum, there's uh, pacman, uh, there's apt, there's package, which kind of is the, the umbrella over all of them. There's DNF. All these different package modules uh, work with different packaging systems. Uh, but in the general case, if you know that the package is the same on whatever systems you're managing, you could use the package module, which is kind of an alias to yum and apt and all these other modules. Um, but I'm, I like being explicit. If I'm only going to work on CentOS servers, I use yum. If I'm only going to work on Fedora, I might use DNF. If I'm only going to work on Ubuntu, I might use apt. Um, if I need something that works on all of them, I'll definitely use package if I can uh, swing it that way. Uh, but anyway, I'm going to use the yum module here. And I'm going to give it the argument uh, name equals NTP, state equals present. And that's going to tell it to make sure that the NTP package is installed via yum on all these servers. And I don't think it is by default. So when this comes back, uh, hopefully it does come back someday. It looks like the CPU is now 100% on the two cores. So we'll see if this, uh, if this survives. Um, once it comes back, it should report that there's a change on each of the servers since it installed a new package. Uh, let me glance at the uh, chat here and see if there's anything else. Someone says, why MacBook? Um, yeah, it, if I didn't do video and photo work, I probably would be using Linux full time. I've tried a couple times. The problem is that, like, uh, what is it, Lighttable and some of the other tools that are available on Linux for uh, media work are just not not even close to as productive as I can be on the Mac with um, Lightroom and Photoshop and. Uh, uh, Final Cut Pro and all these different tools that, that are only available either on Mac or Windows. Um, so, and Windows is kind of out of the question because it's just not fun to, to work in open source development for all the Linux tooling that I use in Windows, even with Windows Subsystem for Linux too. Um, anyway, yeah, Aaron, Aaron mentions Windows 10 plus Subsystem for Linux is pretty nice. It is pretty nice, but the problem is that, uh, you know, if I'm going that far, it's it's a big change from doing all the tools that I'm used to on my Mac. Uh, for example, like Transmit, there's no FTP client I've found on Windows. And you might be laughing, like, FTP, who still uses that? I work with a lot of organizations, a lot of nonprofits especially, that still have little uh, old-fashioned FTP-type servers. And I still I use it for SFTP, too. Uh, but I still have to work with those things. And Transmit is just this, like, there's a lot of little gems like Transmit on the Mac that don't exist on Windows. And believe me, I've tried a couple times. Uh, there are some good apps on Windows for sure, but uh, you know, it, switching platforms from Mac to Windows is not as easy as, as some people would think. Anyway, we're still waiting for this package to install. I wonder if it's going to install in the next 15 minutes or we're just going to keep talking until the end of this, uh, this live stream. <laughs> yeah, and, and someone also mentions for Windows, um, that uh, Vagrant, Vagrant, in, Vagrant interacting with VirtualBox through the uh, Windows subsystem for Linux can be challenging. WSL2, which is still not in a public release, it's in the Insider channel right now, which I have access to and I've been testing it. Uh, WSL2 is a little better for sure, uh, but it's still not as seamless as uh, you know, working in, on a Linux machine or on, on Mac OS for me. There's other good suggestions in the comments on some different Windows apps and things. Uh, good rebuttals against whatever I say, for sure, but, uh, but that's not going to convince me right now. Anyway, so it looks like it finished on one server. It's still going on the other two. Uh, this is definitely a lot slower. So I guess it's a good time to plug. If you do want to sponsor me on GitHub, or uh, if, if you work for Apple and you have access to uh, MacBook Pro inventory, go ahead and ship me one. That'd be awesome. Um, or heck, I, I'd take a Mac, one of the new Mac Pros, you know, the $54,000 model that uh, I think Marcus Brownlee or whoever uh, had gotten the, the high-end, highest model. That would probably do a little bit better job uh, than this MacBook Pro. 
so it looks like it finished, and like I said, it says it's changed because it uh, it it uh, performed a change on each of the systems, and it gives us the output from Yum uh, with the installation. Something that I haven't talked about, and uh, I might later on in the series, is the output here that we're getting. You can see there's a bunch of new line characters, and the the output is kind of messy. This is the default output of Ansible, and the reason that it's done this way is this is this is like easily uh, easily formatted universally on all the different systems and all the different uh, clients. There's actually different ways to get output from Ansible when you run these commands, and one of them that I like is the YAML uh, the YAML output uh, format. Uh, and I have a blog post on jeffgearling.com about that if you want to search uh, for YAML Ansible output. Uh, that makes this a little cleaner and and the new lines are formatted nicely so that you can read this output uh, but for most purposes it's not that important um, and uh, you can set that in an ansible configuration file which we'll get into later uh, so if i run this command again on all these different things and uh, thank you aaron for sponsoring me uh, it's extremely helpful um, if i run it again it should it should be a lot quicker because it's not actually installing anything We'll see if that's the case or not. Uh, but it should come back and report that there were no changes. Yeah, so it's saying success. And this is the message it got back from Yum when it tried uh, when it checked on NTP. Uh, and so, it, again, it's, it's a quick way using ad hoc commands to see if something's installed or not, to install things. Um, and another note that I have in the book is uh, you can actually use the full name for these things. So dash become is the become uh, parameter. And that says, as I as I mentioned earlier, it's it becomes the the root user using sudo by default. And you can actually set a different method. So if you have a different system that doesn't use sudo to elevate privileges, you can actually use different uh, become methods to become a user that has higher privileges in different ways. But again, I'm I'm working on Linux here, so it's pretty much always sudo. Um, also, if you don't if you don't actually have an SSH key. In your commands, you can specify uh, dash k, and that's an, a shortcut for dash dash ask become pass, and that will let you. Or, or sorry, I'm I'm confusing myself here. So if if your sudo um, if using sudo requires a password, so in Vagrant, the Vagrant user always can become sudo passwordless, and the settings for that and are in the slash etsy slash sudoers file. Um, if you if you actually need to enter a password to become the root user because you're not using passwordless sudo you can you can set this command uh, flag which is ask become pass or dash k and what ansible will do is it should ask for a password uh, and this is the basically if you're going to run a sudo command what password do you enter for that uh, in my case i don't need that uh, but if i did i could put in i think it's vagrant um, and it would still work using Vagrant because Vagrant is the password for the Vagrant user. And, uh, but it's not necessary with these Vagrant boxes because of the way that Vagrant has you set them up. Um, so another thing that you might do uh, after you install a service is make sure that it is um, actually running. Because a lot of times, you, you know, if you're going to install something, you might actually want to use it. Uh, so I'm going to, in this case, use the service module. Uh, the service module intelligently determines whether the, the underlying system for managing services is systemd or initv or whatever else it is. Um, and most things are, are automatically detected really easily. And the service name for NTP is ntpd for NTP daemon. And I'm going to want to make sure that it's actually running. So I'm going to say state equals started and enabled equals yes uh, to make sure that when I reboot, it's also going to start up when it reboots. Uh, so I'm going to do that, and I'm also going to show you, so if, if you're interested in how do you find out what all these parameters are, there's a couple ways to do that. One way is, uh, this is the way I usually do it, is I say Ansible service module. And trusty Google usually gets you to the documentation for it, which is nicely formatted, easy to see, easy to read. Um, and if you ever find a problem in the documentation, you can click on this little link and get to the page for the, the module and, and make the changes and some, uh, contribute back to Ansible. Uh, but it gives you all the options that are available here. And we just use name, uh, state, these are the different uh, choices for state, and enabled, yes or no. And uh, so it's, oh, I, I don't want to use the become password anymore because that just trips me up. 
So I'm going to do that, and it'll probably take a few seconds. Um, and that's the service module. Uh, you can also say, uh, I believe it's Ansible doc service. I could be wrong here. But the Ansible doc command uh, will give you back documentation for any module that you have. And here you can see uh, the service module control, control services on remote hosts. This is basically the same thing that you're seeing uh, on this page, but it's formatted a little bit differently for the command line. So you can see options. Um, if it has an equal sign, it's mandatory. So you have to give it a name. And um, the the uh, the formatting here is a little bit a little bit. I I generally like reading it on the the web interface just because it's a little easier. I can also link to things if I'm documenting what I'm doing, that kind of thing. But either way it works. And if you're on a computer that's disconnected from the internet, this, this will still work, the Ansible doc command, whereas the internet, of course, will not be working. Uh, oh, and this is fun. Interactive authentication required. Well, that's annoying. I thought it didn't need that, but maybe it does. Let's do dash K and say, Vagrant. Oh, it's because I didn't. It's because I didn't use B, so I need to take out this K and just do B because I need to use the pseudo user. And I'm sure that somebody's going to comment while I'm talking right now on the fact that I forgot to use dash B, and uh, that's just the way it is when you have this delay in the live stream. Uh, so now it's saying that uh, the services were enabled, and so it changed it. And again, if I run the command again, due to Ansible's item potence, meaning if you run the command uh, once or a million times, it's going to result in the same end state, uh, it should say that there's no changes this time. And the text should be green, highlighting the fact that it didn't change anything. Yep. And so um, there, there's a lot of other things that we could do. Uh, another thing that you could do it with NTP in particular is you can say, uh, dash a service NTP stop. Uh, that's gonna whoops. That's gonna stop the service. Uh, if you want to manually force an update of the of the NTP uh, time and date, you can do this. Uh, you can say service. Uh, let's see, NTP date is the command to control the time. Dash Q, and we'll give it a server. Zero dot red red hat enterprise Linux dot pool dot NTP dot org. Uh, so that's going to force an update on these servers. And if that ever finishes up. When I, when I tested these commands a, a week or two ago when I was preparing for this, they ran in about uh, three to five seconds. So obviously the live stream kind of makes for a lot, of, uh, a lot of delay here. So you can see the offset's not that far off. Um, but it, sometimes your servers can drift by a second or two, and that can start causing issues with databases and, and uh, clustered systems. Uh, so after you do that, you'd want to make sure that you start the service again. NTPD start. And again, you, this when I run the command, it's always going to report changed. Uh, and it's probably better if you, and, and Ansible even warns about this, um, it's better to use Ansible's own modules for these things. So Ansible warns you, hey, you're using the service command. We have a module that does this item potently. It's easier to use. It's easier to parameterize. Uh, so <clears throat> for things like this, it's better to use that kind of command than to, um, than to run the command uh, like this. If Ansible has a module for it, you should probably use the module. And similar things for like curl for downloading things. Ansible has modules for downloading files from the internet. And Ansible has modules for uh, uh, interacting with web services. So use those. <clears throat> so there's, there's also in this chapter a longer example that I'm not going to go all the way into for uh, setting up a, a, a Django application uh, on these two app servers. And the, the basic uh, setup is you could use ad hoc commands to install MySQL Python, so you have bindings so that Ansible will control your MySQL server. It installs uh, Django uh, using easy install, uh, or you can use pip to install it as well uh, using ad hoc commands. Uh, Ansible has modules for all these things, so you could use uh, the easy install module or the pip install module to install Python dependencies. Uh, and you can even run uh, uh, you can run Python through Ansible's command module 
uh, to test that Django's working. All this stuff is in the book in chapter three. I'm looking at page 29 of the 1.22 version paperback. Uh, when you manage, uh, there's seven different versions of the book, so it's, it's sometimes hard to say exactly where something is. Um, uh, but all these different things that I'm doing are a little bit better served in a playbook, and I'm not going to spend all the time, especially since it takes like five minutes per install uh, to do them all. But another thing that, that it's illustrating is the fact that we've been working on all the servers, but I can just work on the DB server uh, by using the DB group, and I can say free-m, and it's just going um, to just going to give me the, the memory statistics for that DB server. And similarly, if I wanted to uh, manage applications or services or things, I can use any of the modules just on the DB server, or I can do it just on the app servers and it would just run it against the two app servers that, def that are defined. Um, and uh, I, I won't uh, install MySQL and everything, but on the DB server, assuming that we had MySQL or MariaDB installed, we could use Ansible's uh, MySQL module, dash M, MySQL user, MySQL user, uh, and give it the arguments like name equals Django, uh, host equals percent sign for any host, uh, password equals one, two, three, four, five. And there's different ways to manage passwords for this particular module, but I'm just showing this option here. Uh, priv equals all databases and all commands. State equals present. And uh, this particular command will fail on the database server because MySQL is not installed, but uh, assuming it were, this would set up a user for MySQL, and then you can also set up a database using MySQL. Um, so uh, in the book, I also mentioned like this is, again, this is probably better served with a playbook, but it's just illustrating that you could do all of the kind of setup that you need to do using Ansible on all your different servers more easily than running shell scripts and trying to manage running it on the different servers and all that kind of stuff. Um, so uh, another thing that, that's important to note with ad hoc commands is you can limit. Uh, so. If it, earlier I ran this command on the, the uh, app servers, and I don't need to use sudo for that. Um, you can also limit it to only run on one of the servers. So I, you can use uh, limit and then um, give it a server name, so 192, and this can be a host name or an IP address, 168.60.4, and I am really bad about finishing off my quotes. Uh, so I can just run it on one server. Uh, you can also give it a list with comma separated of servers, and you can use different arguments. I believe it's uh, something like uh, colon not something, not a, a different, not a particular server. Uh, there's different arguments that you can use, and you can look that up in Ansible's documentation for the specifics. That's getting a little bit more into the detailed esoteric usage of inventory. Um, and typically, if you're starting to do a lot of that stuff, you might want to look into changing the way that you use inventory because you shouldn't be doing advanced things that are deeper in Ansible's documentation that often. I think the first time I ever actually had to do that was a month or so ago when I had an inventory with 70-something servers for the service I run called Hosted Apache Solar. Uh, one of the servers was having really weird uh, DNS issues. It's always DNS. And... Um, I was trying to make it so that I could run a playbook on all the servers but that one until I could figure out what was going on with that server because it was kind of a pet server since it was the only server in that region that had a certain um, capability that I was trying to target. So anyway, I, I had to exclude that one server from my whole inventory and I didn't want to like change the inventory because it's using a dynamic inventory, which I'll get to in a later chapter. Uh, and so I had to use all servers except that one. Um, so anyway, that's that's one way to do things. Uh, you can also use regular expressions in here. So I can say uh, some forms of regular expressions. I can say star dot four, and that's going to do the same thing as the above command did, uh, unless you had certain like a bunch of uh, different IP addresses. Some of them that had dot four, um, and uh, basically you can do almost anything uh, to target different groups of servers using the inventories that Ansible uh, that you set up in Ansible. Uh, it looks like we're running up on time at this point, so I'm, I'm going to stop there, but um, in the rest of that chapter, chapter three, uh, there's examples for managing users and groups. There's a group module that Ansible has. There's a user module that Ansible has that manages Linux users and groups. Uh, so look in the book for more detailed examples. Uh, you can use the package, package, yum, and apt, and those kind of things. You can get information about files using the stat module. 
You can copy files to servers using the copy, uh, copy module. You can retrieve files from servers using the fetch module. Again, to get documentation, you can use Ansible doc or look it, on, look it up on Google. Uh, you can create files and directories using the file module. Uh, you can uh, delete directories using the file module using state absent. Uh, you can even run uh, commands in the background, and they might actually get into that uh, leading off the next, uh, next episode of this. Uh, because that's something that's a little bit more interesting and, and sometimes you might want to quickly run a job that could take hours on all your servers. Um, so we'll leave it at that. And um, I wanted to remind everybody again that all these episodes are recorded. So if you missed the beginning of this, please go back. Uh, it'll be on my YouTube channel. It'll still be up at the same URL. So if you're watching it right now, you'll be able to see it. You can scroll back, uh, scrub back in the timeline and, and watch the rest of the video. Um, and uh, again, if, if you like what you see, please click the subscribe button, which is right below me. I am always, it's hard to see in the, the mirror image here. It's right below me, the subscribe button. You'll be able to see all the videos on my channel when they come up. Um, and if you hit the notification icon, which I don't like doing, uh, you'll be able to get a notification when a new live stream like this one starts. Um, uh, and, you know, as I've been saying throughout the past few weeks, uh, it's, it's been a kind of tough time for everyone. I know I'm getting extremely tired of The Little Mermaid. I've started memorizing most of the songs and I'm even, I had a dream about one of the songs because my youngest daughter who's potty training has been uh, requesting that every time that she goes to the potty. She's like, oh, now I get to watch this song from, from she calls it Ariel, not The Little Mermaid. And I know that uh, I'm not alone in that. I think a lot of parents and a lot of, uh, a lot of people that have to manage kids around the house are starting to get to their wits end. Um, so we're all in it together. Keep talking to each other. Keep uh, reaching out. Um, like I said at the beginning of the video, we're starting to see some personal effects, uh, some people getting laid off or furloughed. Please reach out to those people. They might be feeling isolated and alone. I mean, in some cases, because they are. Uh, especially, you know, if you don't have a family at your house, if you're alone or if you uh, have a roommate or something who's, uh, you know, if, if there's two introverted roommates, they they might need somebody to say hello and, and just welcome them. So um, please, uh, please reach out. Please connect to each other. Um, thank you for joining this live stream. I hope you'll be back next week again, and uh, we'll get back into a couple more ad hoc commands and then jump into our first major playbooks that we run. Uh, so I will see you later, and I will try to find where YouTube's end stream button is and see what happens. Sometimes it cuts me off right in the middle of a sentence. Other times uh, it doesn't, and I just look like a fool. We'll see.